Hello, speaking to you from beautiful southern Ukraine. I'm live and live, Stepan Prokhorenko from IndyCup, and this is IndyCup Sessions. Today we are talking to the amazing Alexis Trust from Chucklefish, the marketing maestro behind the success of all their games for the last few years. Hello, Alexis, how are you? Good, yeah, I'm getting there. Uh, if you can see someone holding a dog underneath their arm, in the, there we go, yep. Yeah. Uh, that's that's just our cleaner. That's how we roll around here. There's constant dogs. How are you? Yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. Very interested to hear what uh, you will be present. I mean, the dog is just beautiful. <laughs> I'm very interested to hear what you will be presenting today. I think that uh, all our participants will be very interested as well. Before you start, I would just like to remind everyone that we will have a small Q&A session right after you finish the presentation. So if you have any questions for Alexis, please enter them in the chat window on the right side of the screen, and we will go over as many as possible after Alexis is finished. With that said, I'm giving you the mic. Uh, we are all very thankful for you joining us today. Uh, off you go. It's my pleasure. Uh, yeah, let me present my tab then. You're going to have to let me know if you can see this. Nope, wrong one. <laughs> there we go. Let's get there. So, uh, yeah, today I'm going to just do like a one on one. Um, essentially, we'll be running through the basics. So, uh, it's good if you're a brand new dev or if you've been doing this for a while and you just want a refresher. But uh, first of all, I'll just introduce myself. Uh, I'm Alexis. I will be your community captain today. Uh, quick intro, obviously. Um, the current comms manager, uh, an independent developer and publisher, Chucklefish. Uh, you might know us as the publishers for Stardew Valley, Risk of Rain, and Eastwood. And we'll also uh, have an in-house development team who've made Starbound, Wargroove, and we're currently working on Witchbrook. Um, my background is largely uh, here, there, and everywhere, both endemic within the games industry and outside of it. So I was the senior community manager for Xbox when we were launching the Xbox One. <clears throat> Several years ago, I've worked with people like EA um, for their like influencer program and uh, pushing their sort of uh, LA events and things like that. It's been quite varied in terms of uh, who I've been working with. Um, but obviously now working at Indie, uh, we do a pretty pretty much a little bit of everything. So uh, I do Steam backend, NCMS support, uh, influencer management, market research, uh, PR, uh, press release writing, everything basically. Yeah, you know, it's an Indie, so you do several things. Uh, over the past 12 years, obviously, I've had pleasure of working with some really cool brands, making cool things uh, and making cooler communities. Uh, but this has nothing to do with game dev at all, but I also point, paint portraits. Um, over the next 30 minutes or so, I'm going to share like a top-down view of why you should be taking community management as seriously as your development of your game. Uh, and I'm going to flip-flop between like a granular best practices for low-budget titles and a little bit of sociology and maybe some thoughtfulness about how you can approach uh, the marketing for your game. Um, so this slide is actually quite an oversimplif uh, oversimplification, not easy to say, uh, but I wanted to include something about the conflation of consumption and identity. Um, there's no doubt in my mind that we attach ourselves to the products that we consume, you know, consumerism. Uh, and sometimes our products uh, form basically part of our core identity. Uh, and whilst it's not inherently a bad thing, it's important to understand the motivations of your players uh, for wanting to engage with you and your product, essentially. Um, in gaming, we talk about like fandoms, which in my opinion is a synonym for neo tribes. Uh, I've often found that when we stop thinking about our player base as a bunch of people who've come together to discuss our products and reframe it as a sociological function as a result of late stage capitalism, I've basically been able to strategize growing and maintaining that space more effectively. Uh, so, what is community management? Um, you're all online, but so you'll probably know this, but to avoid any doubt, uh, community management is the process of building connections with your players, uh, with the primary goal of converting them to become an extension of your business function. Typically, people see this relationship as a kind of one-way thing, uh, but it's worth noting that these bonds are kind of mutually beneficial when the space is kind of curated and healthy, uh, which can be done with the help of a quality community manager. Hmm. 
Community managers will evangelize your studio values, set the expectations for your title, and curate your player base uh, ready for things like feedback sessions. Um, those company values are really important for attracting the right kind of player and also a great way to share the themes of your game, which leads nicely into setting the expectations for those players. Um, I think we all know some studios have uh, allowed their player base to kind of set the narrative surrounding their game and ended up disappointing fans who've expected something completely different. Uh, they've either over-promised or under-promised and it's really, uh, it has really serious consequences for the su success of your game. Um, and a community manager can be a massive help here. Uh, finally, whether it's through early access, open or closed betas, or post-launch, the feedback process is just inevitable. Um, a well-curated community space will improve the quality of that feedback for your game and thus improve your game. So every community role that I've uh, had across multiple companies with each and various community goals and budgets has been completely different. Uh, this is basically a non-exhaustive list of various hats to put on through the years, um, and no doubt your own business will need these functions at some point as well. Um, even now at this own studio, uh, this studio here, I'm having to prioritise different aspects of this list based on kind of time of the year, where we are in the dev cycle, that kind of thing. Um, ideally, if you don't have a dedicated social media manager, you'd have the social media at the front of your community management tasks, followed by content creation blog management, then player support and influencer outreach. I'll touch on each of these aspects individually as we go along. Um, this is some thought experiments I've been kind of doing. Um, it's a member matrix that I created uh, as an exercise to kind of reframe community. Um, I'll explain what I mean by toxicity and the impact uh, so you can understand what your own role looks like within this space. Um, because impact isn't necessarily how often someone contributes to a space. It can also include the wider reputation and how serious their word is taken by other members. Um, so if the lead creative posts in Discord once a month or a YouTuber with 1 million subscribers makes a video, they would constitute as high impact, uh, but not necessarily working functions of within your community. Um, this can also include community members who act as an extension of the business function. Um, so these folks are those who help other players. They do like knowledge sharing. They like help with uh, book reports, and they'll create peripheral content for the games, like memes, videos, that kind of thing. Um, someone with low impact but high toxicity would likely be a player complaining about the game in a way which doesn't improve the experience for anyone else. They're just there to yell at you, essentially. Um, a healthy community will always encourage players to encourage one another in a non-toxic way. So they'll push the low toxicity group, uh, sorry, pushing the low toxicity group to increase their impact in the space is the overarching goal of any community manager. Uh, it's important to highlight good behavior, engage in and elevate those community members who are actually inspiring uh, and reflect the com company's values. Uh, the opposite of this is an unmanaged space, which very quickly becomes uh, super, super toxic. Uh, very quickly, the community will establish its own hierarchy without your input. And often those who will rise to the top will be just like the loudest, most disruptive people. Um, once this happens, it's extremely uh, difficult to untangle. Uh, as soon as your community is known for being toxic, it's much more difficult to attract and maintain, uh, retain good people within that space as well. Um, meaning that uh, th this kind of thing overspills into the rest of your business function. So it'll impact your reviews, uh, it'll impact uh, people tweeting about the game and like people coming in to respond, even whether that's aggressively or not, you know. Um, but there's also a few ways to uh, healthy communities gaining toxic members over time. So sometimes your loudest and most helpful supporters can also become your most toxic members, unfortunately. Uh, inflating the importance of specific members can actually, uh, and turning a blind eye to like poor behavior simply because of their helpfulness can lead to vicious like in-groups within your spaces um, that will inevitably implode and end up harming your overall community health. Um, sometimes this can be your own mods, uh, which is trifical, uh, tricky, tricky to deal with. Um, on rare occasions, you can convert low impact, high toxicity members to high impact, low toxicity members. Sometimes players will just come into your space and lash out with no actual plan to help themselves, you or other people. But if you can engage with them with good faith and empathy, they might actually become brand advocates. Um, we all have bad days, essentially. <clears throat> uh, so despite Current social media climate, uh, Twitter is still your A-tier social media platform for choice if you're going, 
If you choose to talk to your players on a single traditional platform, I strongly advise sticking to Twitter, forgetting Mastodon or Hive or whatever this week's new hotspot is. Um, until there's somewhere that has like a proven track record for discoverability and data security, just don't bother moving at all. Um, second to this, please get to TikTok. Uh, professional partners, friends, other publishers, and Simon's Game Discover Code newsletter, which I highly suggest going, uh, looking for it, has confirmed that TikTok basically can single-handedly drive major sales for indie developers. Um, so as long as you find the right tone for your game and you can post consistently every day, which I know sounds like a lot, but you got to figure out where you want to put your time and effort, then it's actually worth the investment, um, I would say at least. Especially because TikTok's demographic is basically the next generation of gamers. Um, my biggest piece of advice for TikTok is to get in touch with gaming department ASAP um, so that they can get you verified and added to their gaming newsletter. Uh, there's also some kind of like redacted things in there uh, within their newsletter that can help you reach other spaces uh, across TikTok, which is super helpful. Uh, but you can't get that until you're sort of NDA signed with them. After this is Discord, obviously, um, super handy for varying reasons. Um, it can be really tough to keep the conversations going in servers. And I've even heard of devs creating dummy accounts to have conversations with themselves uh, just in order to create. Uh, generate more interest in the space, uh, which is the same with Reddit, though Reddit are more on the ball for like shadow banning users who do this. So uh, I don't recommend doing that over there. But the one thing I really love about Discord is the ability to run meta games. Um, and if you've not seen it already, I actually highly recommend checking out how um, there's a publisher called No More Robots. And they did a Yes, Your Grace, which is a published game. They did a Discord meta game for that. And it was really, really successful. Um, and it's like a pretty good blueprint for if you want to expand the, uh, your game story and your game's function outside of the actual physical game itself. Um, Facebook, absolutely not. Don't waste your time. Uh, not unless you've already got a space there with a sizable fan base. I don't recommend setting up a page at all. Uh, even the advertising can kind of be hit or miss on the platform. And the same goes for Instagram. There's a market for there for, sorry, there's a market there for cute and cozy games with like a, wholesome aesthetic but less so for everything else your shooters your card games that kind of thing um nothing is more sad than a dead social media platform so uh don't set up a, a page without thinking about your strategy and how you're going to implement content within that space but what i do recommend actually is park on a username without having an active account so that you don't have to deal with impersonation down the line so what you can do with that is basically set up a you know r name of your game and then just lock it make it private um same with twitter accounts things like that um even you know it, it, it becomes more apparent when you're at sort of a larger publisher or a larger developer fans will try and take those names as soon as you um announce that you're doing anything with them and then try and sell them back to you which kind of sucks and i say fans quite loosely because that's obviously not very fun to have to deal with so i recommend getting in there sooner rather than later and also checking um real basic things like you've got this uh, great name for this game and there's a you want to see what's already on the market just check throw it into steam see what's out there already what kind of genre it's representing that kind of thing um just within that vein <laughs> uh so without naming any names i've listed a bunch of skill sets here that i've seen on job descriptions for community and social media managers um, each of this is its own specialization in of itself. I can understand that community managers are supposed to be the horses for courses types, but the quality or output is never as high or polished as professionals in those spaces. So ideally, you or your CM would focus on uh, ideation, tip the toes into graphic design very rarely. Uh, I know this, this slide isn't broken, there's just, uh, and there's some candidate requests that kind of go off the page, but I just wanted to demonstrate that often a lot of pressure to ideate, create, execute, report, and then everything that comes with it uh, for community managers and social media managers. It's really easy to like give them everything or it's really easy to look at this list and go, oh crap, I need to do all this. But you absolutely don't. You need to figure out what is right for you and your game because there is no uh, cookie cutter version of community or social or marketing at least. Um, for me personally as well, when I've been too overwhelmed, I stop reporting completely. Like, uh, And it's led to a sort of getting game of content which works with your community. So it's not super helpful. But I genuinely believe that if, if you're a good enough community manager or if you're good enough social media manager, you can kind of do this and get away with it. Um, for a lot of indie devs, obviously, they're kind of like, 
the narrative designer, the the gameplay director, the you know they're, they're doing everything, and then also doing their marketing on the side. So it's a little bit more difficult to figure out what your fans are reacting to without that level of reporting. Um, consider it at least. Uh, listening tools also exist. They're extremely expensive. I don't recommend them based on that. Um, what, what I mean there is um, a tool called like sentiment trackers. Uh, and essentially, you can type in keywords based on your brand, your name, your competitors as well, um, and just see what how what conversations are happening around them, what fans are excited for, that kind of thing. Uh, but yeah, they're super expensive. Unless you've got a friend that works at like a bigger studio, I don't recommend. Uh, getting your own you could just ask them to quickly run a report for you um, I don't have any real practical advice for this section actually uh, other than to be aware of the kind of workload it takes to maintain these social media spaces um, so yeah look after yourself first and foremost so people tend to forget the audience when they're writing dev update blogs which leads to an over and under explanation of uh, what's going on in the game uh, and over and under sharing of information. Once you've gotten to the swing of things with your first few updates, it's safe to say that you can lead with a friendlier tone and you should 100% be talking about your work as excitedly that, as you expect a fan to, would be to talk about your work. Um, so this can be applied to negative updates as well. If you're delaying a game, be sure to PR spin it um, to say that you want to make sure it's the best game you can make for the support. Um, the other thing as well, obviously, is... <laughs> So speaking of thank yous, uh, be sure to thank your community often. And I mean that quite sincerely. I don't mean like in a fake way. I mean, sincerely, you know, they're waiting for your game. They're trying to support you. Thank them for their patience. Thanks. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, no. Thank, thank you for your patience. Thank you for your support. Thank you for the kind words. Thank you for the feedback. Even if the feedback's like, you fucking suck, bro. Like, take the, take the high road. I know it doesn't feel good all the time, but you can. Uh, the cute, wholesome kind of, we appreciate our fans. Indie Dev Vive can actually really go um, a long way um, especially if you're like a one or a two man team explaining that to people people are kind of more understanding um, also if you are going to do blogs keep them fairly short frequent helpful uh, self-explanatory really don't kick off a dead blog unless you're willing to keep it up because uh, it'll lead to fans screaming at you is this game abandoned which you you know you don't want uh, that kind of negative output especially if it goes unchallenged leads to other people thinking the same thing and then just repeating it verbatim um which is sort of community 101 uh, 101 rather you want to empower them to be able to take the information that you've given them and be able to repeat it which is feeds back into your blogs as well if you keep it simple uh, and you keep it short that kind of information can be essentially regurgitated to the rest of the community without long wordy lengthy explanations that are too complex for them um, your Steam blogs should be posted everywhere that you have a digital footprint as well. It shouldn't say just on the intended platform that you wrote it for. So if you have these platforms, think about Reddit and the sticky posts. Think about your Discord announcements, Twitter, etc. You can't expect your players just to be on Steam uh, when you've posted an update. Uh, real easy one here. Your community managers can support on these, but it shouldn't be their responsibility. Players are going to find a way uh, anywhere and everywhere to report bugs. So make it easier for you and your staff, or if you have any, by making dedicated spaces on Steam or Discord. Um, you don't want your you don't want bug reports and complaints clogging up your email or your web forms because uh, it can be extremely frustrating. I also um, highly recommend creating separate feedback spaces for the languages you've localized into if you can support them. So if you are multilingual, this is always helpful. Um, it just shows that you care about those regions and you're actually doing a, a, a job to listen to them. Um, yeah, indie dev. Ooh. So I don't actually want to bog you down with too much information because influencer management is like a whole song and dance that requires full-time staff member to maintain. I believe it does at least. Uh, but if you're on a shoe, shoestring budget, then this is a quick and free way to start building those relationships. So... Um, the screenshot here is a great website called Sully Gnome, um, and it tracks every single streamer and what games they play. Luckily for us, they've got an immense amount of information on file for you to play with and apply for your own titles. Um, it's a slow burn, but it is the best way to start building your own database of influencers. Uh, and it's an easy method. It involves just basically typing in a game um, that are in the same genre of the game that you are creating in the market and see who's playing them. Uh, you'll see exactly how long uh, they're being played for, uh, which countries 
uh, playing them and it's worth taking note as well. Um, I don't know, say you've got a card game, for example, and you look at like the top 10 card games for 2022, you take all those down, you can see all the influencers that are playing them and you can see on the screenshot there, there's like a little CSV on the right hand side. Uh, you just download everyone that's playing it. Typically, these people will have like their email addresses um, on their accounts and you can pinch them. It's basically data scraping, um, but this is literally the only way that people do it. Uh, you'll have people in your inboxes being like, hey, I've got this great influencer, I really wants to play your game, da, 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 it's 20K, and no, you don't want to have to deal with that. Um, but yeah, it's a really good way of seeing what languages, uh, oh, sorry, what regions people are playing these things in, because you also want to you know, take a sort of more, uh, a wider vision of, where your audience is and is it worth localizing into their spaces? So it's not necessarily take, looking at all these games on Steam, it's also looking at who is playing these games. And if the developers or publishers that are putting these games on Steam are actually localizing in the right areas, because oftentimes you will see people will default to, um, you know, if localization is something you want to do, people sometimes just default to eFigs. We get pitched a lot and people say we want to do English, uh, Italian, German, Spanish, French. <coughs> Um, but that's not necessarily always where the audience is for that game. So definitely take a more um, top-down approach to where you would consider localiz localizing into, which languages you consider localizing into. Uh, yeah, this is my <laughs> this is my uh, spreadsheet. It's quite old now. It's kind of out of date. Uh, but here's a quick peek. Um, I've hidden some of the columns, of course. Um, this is currently over 2,000 entries, and I grow it every single week. Um, you won't need something as chaotic as this because obviously we've got several games that are coming out. Um, but setting aside uh, a week to collate this information will be incredibly value, uh, valuable for you on launch. Um, whilst it's not necessarily community management, a lot of this macro influencers will have interacted with your official channels and you can often highlight micro influencers in return for them checking out your game. So you're not always spending lots and lots of money. Um, this is literally just all data scraping. Um, you don't need to buy these from PR agencies. You don't need to work with, uh, like if you want to self-publish, you you know, you know, don't need to work with a publisher to grab all this. It does take some time, but I believe it's worth it. Um, for, to be clear as well, these these kinds of sheets are PR companies bread and butter. Um, they'll basically charge you big dollar for the access to this kind of information. So just be sure to attempt it yourself before you you know decide to fork out for it. Because it's not that difficult to collect this kind of info. Um, if you can find the right creators to work with, it can change your entire sales tra trajectory, essentially. Um, also, don't be afraid of supporting channels that don't have big numbers because you never know where they'll be in a year's time. Um, personally, I've seen channels go from like five people to 100K in literally just nine months, which is insane. Uh, press. Oh. So not a lot of people know this, but you can talk to PR companies just to send out a blast or a press release. You don't have to work with them on an entire campaign. You can literally just say to them, we've got this game coming out. Uh, here's the dates for it. Here's all the assets. And they will just send that out for you for a much smaller fee than you know being on a retainer or hiring them as a proper PR company. Um, you don't have to spend on a long-term campaign with them at all, though they will probably try and sell that to you. Um, when looking for a PR company, be sure to do your research as well, because there's some out there that just do, do some amazing creative work, um, some seriously spectacular creative work, but just don't have, uh, don't actually get any kind of results off the back of it when it comes to coverage. And some are really quiet about their work, um, but have all the right connections to get your game coverage. It's um, an odd one, given that, you know, the nature of VR. Um, if you have zero budget, but you have the time and energy to create your own press lists, and uh, good luck. Uh, here's how you can do that. First up, you want to concentrate on outlets that are Metacritic and OpenCritic accredited because your unique monthly visitors is typically a lot higher and the quality of the outlet is implied. You want to go to Metacritic, type in a particular, uh, any popular game, any will do. You can scroll down to the outlets that cover that game and you can start collecting their emails into a sheet. Um, you can find their contacts typically in like their about section or their staff section, or they'll have like a form for you to fill in. A lot of them are just like news at IGN.com, that kind of thing. I don't actually think that's a real email address. But um, yeah, again, it's a data scraping operation um, and it definitely works if you've got no budget. You can, um, 
I, I remember working on a indie game probably six years ago. And I just I literally just hired my niece who was nineteen at the time. Just be clear, hired my niece to go through a big list that I kind of collated for her, and she managed to get quite a few done in a day. So it's you know it's it's monkey admin type work. It's easy. Um, you can see the start of my own list here, which is some uh, columns hidden again. Uh, PR companies have lists like this and it's their bread and butter. They'll not give you them because it's a painstaking amount of work to compile um, and maintain relationships with these people. But uh, once you have this kind of list, you should be looking at who reviewed your competitors' games, um, if they reviewed them well, and how you can best contact those people. Often you can go directly to the journalist, especially if they're a freelancer, they'll pitch it to an editor on your behalf. Um, on a personal note, I've been collating this specific list for over a year now, and let me tell you, it's an absolute nightmare. If you can offload any of the marketing function to a professional agency, this is this is the bit. Um, if you're going to do a pre-launch discount, be absolutely 100% sure you have your discount planning down. Uh, I've seen lots of games this year do pre-orders at 100% and then go straight into a pre-launch discount, which ended up basically pissing off players who wanted to purchase who ended up purchasing us. Uh, purchasing their game at full price. Um, I'd also say anything over 10% initially, straight off the bat, is a massive disservice to the art that you are creating. Um, of course, you're welcome to price your game whatever you like, um, but be careful that you don't devalue your title too quickly because I know it can be tempting to try and clear out, the, clear out those wish lists really early. It's not generally worth it because it harms your longer tail. Um, if this isn't your first title and you're the product owner, you can actually generate vouchers that go into the inboxes of users on Steam. So um, something tells me actually within the last week they've taken this function down, but it's worth contacting Steam just to talk to them anyway. You can definitely generate discounts for people that have bought your previous titles, though, 100%, um, and then use your channels to let them know. So, um, you know, Wargroove 1, for example, um, we just announced Wargroove 2, so we use Wargroove 1's uh, new Steam News system to ping everyone that the sequel was out, that kind of thing. And also, if you own one, then you might get a discount on two. That's how that works. It's pretty easy. Um, to my knowledge, though, you can't actually go below 5%, which is a, kind of a shock, but I suppose it's less enticing for players. Um, try to get involved with everything and anything Valve related and Valve supported. And when you do, um, set a looped stream of your game to the page, because not only will it boost your visibility, but you'll also have sort of live tracker on the page. The number of wish lists of Valve support varies widely, and I've had people disagree with the number that I've got on screen. Uh, but from this experience, uh, this is where they say to start. This is where they start to take notice of you and your game, uh, and can possibly help you with like front page support on your launch day. Um, lastly, Steam users are a beast of their own. So whoever your CM or community, uh, community manager or your social media manager will want to use the moderation tools at will here because this one bad egg is basically enough to set off several threads of like chronic malcontent and trolling. Um, so remember, these players aren't necessarily your core community, but they do require your attention. Live events. Hmm. Uh, it's been a while because of the pandemic and everything that's going on, but um, events management teams can and will bargain for spots. Uh, and what I mean by that is I feel it might be a bit cheeky, but you can use the I'm just an indie line uh, on a lot of events companies and they'll go, oh, well, we'll give you 20% off this spot or, oh, well, we've actually got um, this indie collective over here and, you know, they're doing this and they've got a spot free. So talk to them. Um, you know, there's absolutely no harm in asking. Uh, a lot of them are kind of ex-journalists that run these types of events as well, um, or are like full-time events people, so they're used to it as well. Uh, they're used to talking to developers. Don't be afraid. Uh, so our last booth actually had this cute little dangly shop sign hanging off the side. Uh, it turned out to be cheaper than the flat artwork that you can see there on the back panel. Um, so think about your booth branding as like a full 360 thing. You've got your countertops, the sides of the desks, and even the seating. Um, and also think about like creative ways to make your stand stand out uh, without spending too much money, obviously. Uh, a big one is fire resistant decorations. Um, you should always ask an event organizers ahead of time because I've seen some lovely booth setups basically torn back down due to fire safety regulations. So if you've, you know, you can give them a thumbs up and say, this isn't going to set on fire with these fairy lights around it. They're all cool with that. Um, yeah, make sure you engage your players as well. Uh, the best time to gather feedback is at these live events. Um, you can 
have the approach of just standing back and getting a better understanding of how players navigate and naturally pass in your game. Uh, I've seen people make the feedback tangible with like sticky notes just on the back base, but it does make your booth look kind of ugly. Where well, just where they're stuck over the key art. Um, can also have a newsletter sign up, just like a physical sign up. Um, uh, physical comp- competitions for like merch and bits of bobs like that, codes for the games that you've made previously. Um, I know it's difficult making a demo full stop, like I know, uh, but if you have a sort of in game challenge and a physical leaderboard, that's always cool and it attracts people back to your booth that have played it already because they'll come back the next day and try to get back higher. Uh, get back higher on that leaderboard and you know they'll tell their friends about it and have in you know competitions with each other um use also use these members to like highlight uh members use these opportunities to highlight members and generate content for social media so if someone's won something ask if you can take a photo um if there's like a leaderboard going on you know it's it's a good cta get people over can you top this person's uh high score that kind of thing uh as I mentioned earlier, playing pre-recorded loops is a must for Steam events, sales, and any launch period. I can't stress enough, it helps a lot with the visibility and gives you like a live tracker on your page just to see how many pay- uh, people are around. Um, it's also a good first introduction to your game that isn't just a trailer or, or a wall of text. Uh, just be sure to add like a, wa- a watermark that basically says pre-recorded on it. Uh, I also strongly advise not tackling streaming unless you're able to keep up a schedule with it essentially um our star mancer devs for example they stream every single friday and it's just two of them and they really enjoy it they feel um i guess re- uh, invigorated by the the community feedback and the sense of community there and having someone live and speaking back and forth uh, but if you're you know if you're not that way inclined then i wouldn't even bother just because setting up a consistent uh stream output is really important um you know, and players don't like feeling abandoned. You don't want to give them a new excuse to kind of put pressure on you to engage with them, especially if you're on a platform that you're not comfortable with, like being in camera. Um, you can also hire a macro streamer to create that loop for you um, and do a dev focus stream with you if you're not entirely confident of being on your own. Sometimes they'll do it for free because they like it for their show reel or their CV. Uh, and I've seen prices as low as maybe like £100 for two hours, which isn't too bad all in all for like London prices. Um, but if it's for your own channel, find someone passionate about your game and it's fun to watch. They don't need to have like a huge following at all, just as long as they're engaging and actually understand the product. Um, this isn't really key management, um, but rather kind of a side hustle bonus. Um, don't let fandom set up a wiki on your behalf and start monetizing your work. Uh, park on a wiki website, launch it around the week before you and encourage your community to build it up over time. Um, it's a really good place to also track dev updates, build logs, game achievements, etc. Um, and when you've got that kind of information, it's really easy to convince develop, uh, developers, it's really easy to convince journalists to create content around your game because it's basically all there. Um, the state of games journalism at the moment means that basically a lot of sites essentially just concentrate on um, guides. Uh, and because of that, they want content that feeds into guides. So if your game kind of becomes a little bit more popular and it's on the up and up, you know, there's a space there for them to sort of go to, crib notes from you and regurgitate your information. It's different when a game journalist does it, when fandom does it. No. Uh, the big one is, though, that you control this space, essentially, and you can put any advertisements that you want around there and you'll be grateful when your game does blow up and you've essentially got free real estate to generate some extra cash and you can advertise in a controlled manner. Um, oh. <laughs> so I want to go back to the slide for a second, just because anyone here has tried to do their own marketing for the game will know that it's not just possible to tick all these boxes, um, and inevitably social media management will prioritize <coughs> will be prioritized everything else here. Um, I've been doing this for over, it says 12 years in these notes, but actually it's 13, 13 years now, um, and I know just how stressful it can be to expect it, some, be expected to do everything in this list. Uh, I urge you to consider healthy throughout the development process. Um, in summary, a little bit of everything on this list is the ideal scenario, but don't feel like you have to do it all. Uh, there's a ton of best practices out there and there's a bunch of freelancers who are more than happy to help you collate data for you. Um, so you don't have to do it alone. There's, you just don't. Thank you. That's it. Um, I believe there's a and a portion. Yes, uh, just let me finish taking my notes because the 
especially just made me uh, come to terms with several things um, that I've been doing here as my career for the last two years. Now, um, I think we had a few questions in our chat, actually. Let's start with a question from Sviatoslav, who's asking whether a dead media page is worse than no page at all. Yes. And if absolutely. it is better to reserve the dead media page uh, and, and make it private, pin in the post uh, with pages that are actively updated instead of like deleting it. Um, so if you've got a media page, so thinking like maybe you've got a Facebook that you set up like two, three years ago, um, I would say private it. Um, unless you've got already got like a sizable audience on there, private it and then move your content focus onto somewhere like uh, Steam, Twitter, Discord, um, right. you know, and TikTok if you've got a space there as well. Um, having a dead page um, fuels that kind of process within the community of like dead game, they've not updated it in ages. And especially if you're a solo dev, that's a lot of pressure on you to basically engage with, with those players and those spaces and there's nothing more demoralizing when your players are like getting angry at you even though you're trying your best you're literally working on it full time and they just don't understand um but having those uh pages that aren't updated regularly just gives them more fuel for that so you want to reduce it's like a, it's a pr exercise you want to reduce the reasons that they can possibly a attack you in any way all right so how much time would you give before like making the decision that the page has, has died? Um, well, if for example, <laughs> if, for example, uh, I'm setting up like a new a new Twitter for my game. Yeah. And like for a year, I've I'm updating and uh, posting information, but there are no subscribers, and like week after week, I'm posting less and less. And then I've stopped posting it altogether. Should I just remove my Twitter after some time? No. Um, in that scenario, I think keep going, um, especially if you're in a in a period where you're like, okay, I'm half. You know, I'm maybe a year into development out of three years, um, so the content's a little bit more like rough and ready around the edges. Um, that content's still kind of interesting, to even to like a small subset of people, whether that be like the the wider dev community or actual players themselves um, and being able to look look back on that stuff is really interesting as well but when you're um, from a publisher perspective if you've got those like live accounts and I can see that you're like trying and you're trying to engage with the community it's actually really like um, positive for me to see because I'm like oh they they care about the players they care about like uh, keeping their community happy even if it's like two three people um, and also I think it's it's not too big of a deal um, you know, if you're spending like three hours making a video and it goes nowhere, don't spend three hours making a video. Like, you just want to like a screenshot. Da, da, da. Like, mm -hmm. limit your time, figure out where you want to put your resources. Right. But I mean, maybe Twitter is not a good example because it's so important to like the games industry. Yeah. Uh, but like, so it's media dependent, obviously. So if I, for some reason, I've uh, made a new Reddit, subreddit for my game and it's empty. I should probably close it, right? Sorry. <laughs> but if, like if it's like if I make a subreddit for my game, if I make a new game and I make a subreddit, but there's really no fans, so it just stays empty. Maybe I'm posting there somewhere, but nobody else. I should probably remove it, but not Twitter because Twitter is so important. Yeah. Um. So quite recently, actually, we ended up locking the Chucklefish Reddit simply because no one was really using it. Um, we just logged it, made it private. It had subscribers. It still has subscribers right now. We could, you know, talk to them every day. But we decided that we'd rather focus on um, the individual games themselves and their individual Reddit accounts. So in that regard, it was it was more beneficial to developers for us to not have that space up. And it's mm -hmm. not that we believe that our, um, you know, it's not that we had lots of people saying like dead game or anything like that. It's more a case of there's no point in. Uh, there's no point in maintaining a space that didn't serve our uh, our published dev developers, essentially. Right. I uh, actually have a few questions while, while we're on this topic. I'll start with a question by Sol. How many times a week do you recommend posting or interacting in Twitter or TikTok? TikTok's a hard one because 
the way that the algorithms work, it's a pain in the bum. Um, it's actually like if you're not posting five times every single week, you know, consistently every single day, then you will drop off the, the algorithm. Um, your content isn't going to get served to as many people, that kind of thing. You start getting punished um, as a result, and that's when you start seeing diminishing returns in terms of effort is not rewarded in the slightest. So if you um, say you posted every single day for a week, and you got really good views on those, and the next week you did two, and then the week after you you posted one, you'd expect far fewer interactions on the third week than you would on the uh, on the individual post for the first week, simply because the algorithms decided that you haven't posted consistently enough. Whereas with Twitter, it doesn't work like that. It doesn't um, punish you for not tweeting as consistently. It will punish you um, slightly for not like interacting with other people on Twitter, which is also a good thing as well, because I see a lot of dev Twitter accounts that don't um, encourage or like talk to other accounts. They just post and nothing else. Uh, maybe they'll talk to fans, but um, as long as you've got like a healthy output, it should be fine. So interacting with other accounts on Twitter means uh, replying to them, retweeting them, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps directing their replies to you, right? Yeah, yeah. So... Something you'll yeah, see a lot of accounts. Sorry, <laughs> something you'll see a lot of um, publisher published accounts do, especially if they've not got a game out, is they'll talk to other publishers. So we we interact with Modern Wolf, your Raw Fury, Devolver. We tweet at each other all the time, um, partly because all the community managers know each other anyway. But um, something I do is retweet uh, what I did when I was in charge of the socials for Chucklefish. Is I would retweet. Um, random pixel artists that, whose art I just really liked I thought was impressive games that we have nothing to do they're not signed with us they're not you know we haven't funded them secretly or anything like that but I just thought we're really cool that our community might be interested in um, so it's also like a knowledge sharing space in that sense mm -hmm. uh, I mean it's just much more approachable I, I think for like mm -hmm. an indie developer than TikTok because it doesn't require, it's really just text, so it's easy to use and doesn't require any video editing skills. Yeah. Uh, so you can use that and you can really take advantage of that and while still not making it like your priority, so you won't be wasting like three hours a day on it. Whether by, well, with TikTok, I mean, I think that it's really easy to go down the rabbit hole and then you're spending like three hours a day making videos, trying to take advantage of that algorithm and thinking that maybe my next video will be the really big thing. Yeah. So you're recommending like using TikTok because it's so important because the next generation will be there, but it's harder. So... If you can't maintain it, I'd recommend just not having it all. It's that, that's definitely one of those spaces where it, it doesn't make sense to keep making really labor intensive content for a space that isn't actually feeding you creatively or like, you know, making you want to continue developing your game, especially if it's make, taking you away from, you know, physically developing your game. Actually, I actually have a question about TikTok content. Uh, I think somebody. Has been asking whether it would be better to show off a game uh, when when you post it on TikTok. Whether it would be better to post it like on YouTube, just horizontally, like the full video, or crop it so it, it's full screen but vertical and just show the part of the game. So the best kind of content um, I have found is when I'm doing, for example, if I'm capturing for the trailer, for example, if I'm doing video footage for that. What I can do with that is splice it into some 4K, lovely 4K screenshots that I can post out and say like, hey, look at these. So that's one big bit of content that you've sliced into maybe three or four. Then you can take GIFs from it as well. Um, maybe you want to update your next blog with some new GIFs, show some new features, that kind of thing. So there's more content out of that. So you want to take essentially whatever bigger part, of, uh, bigger piece of content and try and splice it into different smaller pieces of content as much as you can. Try and, you know, save your time as in areas where it doesn't make sense right. to just do bespoke things. So really your advice is like, if the developer is working on their marketing themselves, uh, it's best to approach uh, everything you do, like, so you can reuse it as many times as possible. Yeah, yeah. In, in the same way that game dev does the exact same thing, right? Like, mm -hmm. you, you don't make a thousand trees, you take that one asset and spread it out as much yeah, as you can. Yeah. Like, 
So you take that one GIF, you make it really good, and then you use it on TikTok as a vertical video. You use it on Twitter like a GIF. Maybe yep. you post it on Steam. Right. Well, uh, <laughs> but the time is limited, so let's just move on from social media. I think Igor has been asking uh, when you showed the uh, spreadsheet that you had uh, with critics, do you use any kind of automatization for the spreadsheets like this, or do you? So you do it all manually. Manually. Um, I think I mentioned when I was going through that slide in particular, sometimes it's an absolute nightmare trying to find contacts for people on sites like really? uh, sites like EGX. It's a little bit easier because you can just go into the staff page and then they'll have like a bio for each staff member and you can take it. If you want to really get granular with it as well, um, we've got a card game coming out, got Wild Frost coming out pretty soon. I want to target those people because they're my target audience in terms of press and also they like thoughts like this fire was really cool makes sense right um how do i find those people let's try and go through their websites let's look on their twitter bios like let's annoy them as much as possible and it is really labor intensive but you'll find that if you do that kind of like specialized targeting especially with press and influencers that the returns on it are much higher than if you just like I don't know, because there's, there's a bunch of people that will email you saying like, hey, I've got the secret press list for packs. Do you want to buy it? And you can buy those, but they're not exactly like going to get you the right old, people. They're probably out of date and they're probably containing a lot of trash information. Yeah. It's always better to do it yourself, right? This actually slides really nicely in our next question. Uh, an independent developer, one of our participants, uh, has asked where... If you're a solo developer with limited resources and say you have like $5,000 that you can spend on marketing, what is the best way to use them? Uh, especially if the game is not very exciting visually, so you can like really splice a lot of gifts that would just promote themselves, but it is still fun to play and it's very replayable. Um, if that's the case, and that was your kind of entire marketing budget, um, I wouldn't say stay away from adverts, stay away from um, sponsoring creators, that kind of thing. Invest it in getting a really good trailer um, with someone who has edited trailers before. So don't just find like a generalized video editor, find someone that really like knows what they're doing, how to sell a game, even if it's, um, because I think we spend roughly about 3K on trailers. Um, If your game isn't like that visually enticing, um, you know, Trying to get the gameplay uh, and ha- you know the, the game feel through a trailer is probably more uh, beneficial to you than hiring like I don't know one influencer because the way that Twitch works as well, especially with like high budget you know AAA indie style games. Um, I'm sure Devolver won't mind me saying this, but when Devolver, for example, when they put a game out, they do a lot of like spend on influencers, and the reason they do that is because they want to thunderclap and get everyone playing the game at the exact same time so that they climb higher on the ranks in terms of um, most popular games and not because uh, like that's kind of like one of their core goals. Whereas sometimes, obviously, as an indie developer, you've got like very, very limited funds. You don't want to just give that money to a, like a handful of content creators. It doesn't make sense. Even if they're like big content creators, I've heard people charging like £30,000 for like one hour of streaming, which is insane. And it's like, that's not worth it because you'd rather have lots of people playing it to climb those ranks. And, you know, Mm. ideally, AAA style, do both, but you can't because you're an indie. Uh, We've actually received a very, very important question just now that I want to cover. Uh, Alexis is not drinking beer during the stream. This is a non-alcoholic beverage and you're not drinking any beer. I can't say that I'm not drinking beer, but Alexis (laughs) is definitely not drinking any beer. Uh-uh. Right, now that this is covered, <laughs> uh, we can move on to our next question. Uh, what what are your tips uh, on promoting a small niche game, like maybe a visual novel, that is story-based around two or three hours of content, and you can't really publish a long replayable demo because that would be like half the game? Yeah, so um, it's a really good question, actually, because we had a very similar... Uh, not issue, but I'll call it an issue for lack of a better word. It was a very similar issue with Inmost, which was one of our published titles. Um, great devs out in Lithuania right now. Um, 
essentially they, that game is two to five at uh, two to five hours, depending on how good you are at like the platforming and the puzzling sections. Uh, and the way that we kind of went about it was we took our focus off like influencer marketing because you don't want people sharing your game too much. Almost, it's like a good yeah. problem to have. Um, so when we did send out like. Uh, we obviously did some influencer stuff, but when we did send out influencer um, embargoes, as it were, we essentially told them, once you get to this chapter, you need to stop. Or once you f- find this person, you uh, see this person within the story, you need to stop. Um, the other way you can do that is like time demos. So if they play the first chapter, um, which is something we're currently doing with Locomotive, which is a game, a published game that isn't out just yet. Um, with visual novels, particularly with visual novels, I think it's the peripheral content that sits within your game. So it's not necessarily the story. It's not those spoilerific moments that you don't want players to um, experience well ahead of time. It's like, who are these people that you're kind of maybe dating or maybe like interacting with? Or um, do they have like gamer profiles? Uh, can you do, can you make, uh, what did we do recently? We took like a, one of a, uh, characters from our games and even if it's nothing to do with dating we like made a tinder profile for them kind of thing like you think about the kind of things um because when i'm when i'm writing as well because i do a little bit of writing when i do writing i think like how does this person take their coffee how you know if do they have a pet if so what kind of pet is it that kind of thing and it's just those extra little bits how can you make them into content moments that make people fall in love with those characters before they've experienced their story what makes sense thematically for you and what makes sense for your game um i hope that's made sense yeah, for so everyone it, listening it, it, you would like try to draw players into the world of your game but not sharing exactly what the game is or like stuff from the game so create like auxiliary content that would enhance the world of the game for the players who are interacting with it on social media yeah exactly um and i think this is actually going back to the meta game that no more robots ran with yes your grace because yes your grace was it's not a super long game i think it's like six hours maybe um that was very like story heavy like you're making choices you're the king uh they couldn't spoil a lot of it so essentially they made a meta game where people were from different villages or different factions in the area and the the community members were like it was, it was insane. community members were like doing challenges against each other and like doing politics and it was nothing to do with what's actually in the game um, but it was like a lot of fun it was just thematic yeah like become the fun of the game from that content and then you want to interact with the game mm-hmm. time consuming um, but i mean if you're working on you know if you're working on a three-hour visual novel or whatever your writer's probably not that busy sorry can you mm. hear that either? oh no 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 it's okay okay <laughs> All right, a few more questions if you have the time. Uh, I do, I have time. If you have, like, if you're maybe not a solo developer, maybe you're a bit bigger, maybe you're a team, and you have uh, an allocated marketing budget, say, five to $10,000, is it better to use it all on some particular channel like TikTok or Twitter, or is it still better to test it out and experiment with different channels before committing to one or the other? Um, I think it really heavily depends on the genre of the game. Because if you're doing like mm-hmm. a, I don't know, a space sim that's about to go in early access, you're probably you're probably going to find more content, especially like replayable games like roguelikes and things like that. You're going to find more content um, that kind of suits TikTok. Anything that's like really aesthetically pleasing, cozy game TikTok would be uh, the people that you'd want to attach to, I suppose, in that sense. Um, otherwise. You know, there's Reddit adverts are really interesting. How they work is basically you bid on um, time. You don't bid on the amount of people that click through. It's very weird. Um, uh, trying to think why, what you would do if you had various genres. Like a, if you're making an FPS. I don't know why you'd make an FPS as an indie, but if you're making an FPS as an indie. Whereas boomer shooters, something right of perhaps. Yeah, um, in that sense, I'd probably focus on maybe like if you're if you're particularly good at making content and it's engaging content, then putting ad spend behind that pe- those pieces of content. Um, like I said, I wouldn't bother putting money behind creators on Twitch unless you've got enough to kind of funnel a lot of people um, into playing your game all at once. Yeah, so you would recommend like 
the first thing you should think about is researching what platform might work best for your game instead of like blindly testing it. Yeah, yeah. Especially because I think, so when I think about marketing budget, I'm not thinking about like advertising and getting out to the player. Marketing budget in my head is like localization and, you know, LQA off the back of that. So like if I look at all these, uh, you know, uh, my genre is a survival horror and I'm an English developer who doesn't speak Polish or Russian. Um, but I know there's a huge uh, amount of people. Actually, here's a good one. You know, there's a huge amount of people that play survival horrors in Russian, uh, Russia and Poland. China, it's a good one. Uh, if you can translate into Chinese, uh, it's probably a better use of your marketing budget than it would be to like put it behind a developer, uh, an influencer, for example getting an extra language out there and being able to communicate with a whole different base of players is really key. Yeah. Uh, I think that's... Like, look, I have a bunch of questions about that, <laughs> but uh, just to return to the original center of that question, uh, they have another one, whether it is best to use that budget uh, if you're buying like ads uh, before your release date, so you would end up in the popular upcoming tab on Steam or rather on the release dates or around the release date, so uh, more people would see that the game is available and buy it. Um, so Steam, or Valve rather, um, heavily implied that any, any kind of marketing activity that you're going to do around their particular platform, so not necessarily applicable if you're sim launching on Xbox and Switch or whatever. Um, they always tell you to put as much effort as you can into the launch day itself. Um, things like that I learned recently actually is if you're going to do a pre-order, for example, if you're not doing like a really robust pre-order campaign, then actually it's really detrimental to your sales. Um, so doing like, I don't know, you've got a pre-order campaign, 10% off, um, and you want to put ads behind that and try and encourage people to wish list and also pre-order or whatever. Um, Valve would basically turn around and tell us if, if that's not a robust campaign, don't bother with it. Just focus on your launch day. Right. But that doesn't really work for the early access, I guess, because that's like your real launch is when you launch early access. Or so, so it goes. Yeah, yeah. You should always treat, if you're going into early access, especially because the, you know, Early access eight years ago means something entirely different to how it means, you know, yeah. to what it means today. Because you only get that kind of launch once, um, which is why ages or something like that. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's you want to focus your efforts on one one period, I suppose, rather than like spread it out across uh, multiple months. Early access is quite fraught these days. I'd be quite anxious about doing early access unless it really made sense to the genre and you'd already built up a community where you could get that feedback because obviously the benefit to early access is the feedback sessions right yeah and how bad is it to uh, launch in early access say you're you, you're like an indie developer you have launched in early access and then you stay in early access for a few years how bad is it if you're not like constantly interacting with community you just on a whim, you have launched in early access, and then you're not doing much much updates, but the game is available in early access. How bad you're going to see people's reviews flip, first of all, because if they can't get hold of you on social media and you're not interacting with them in Discord, um, an early access space needs to be like really lively. You need to be interacting with them constantly and giving them updates yeah. so that they can feed back. You need, like, that's when it's like truly a bridge where you need to feed them content for them to give you feedback, etc. If you start cutting off the side, they're going to just walk away. And as soon as, before they walk away, they will change all their reviews to negative. They'll start doing, um, you know, if they can, they'll get refunds. Um, if it's if it's Kickstarter, they'll be complaining on the uh, comments page. If it's uh, Twitter, Discord, dead game, dead game, dead game. It's just, that's what kind of what you want to avoid. If you can't keep up with an early access period, don't do it. Do a closed beta. Figure out what you have resource-wise and go from there. So after you launch early access, it's really like you should you should be in overdrive. You should be constantly interacting with everyone. You should not think that you have the time now to calmly develop your game because you have some source of income. Yeah, if anything, it's it's more pressure, right? Because you need to 
you've now got lots of eyes looking at you as opposed to just your internal pressure that you have on yourself. Um, yeah. I would say, like, if you went to early access and then you started getting quieter and quieter, it's like going to it's like going to E3, showing off your game and literally not watching players play it to get feedback because what's what's the point if you're not having that sort of two-way conversation with them? So you really should understand what you're getting out of early access, whether you're just planning to uh, work on the game with uh, your community feedback. So you have a lot of players playing your game, you have a lot of feedback and you just want another way of interacting and improving your game, or maybe, I don't know, you're launching it like really near your release date. You just want to work out a few things and then you have the plan to release it, but you know, then you're probably muddying up your chances because uh, your early access release is the actual release date. So yep. you should always approach it like that. Okay. You also need to think about your bottom line as well, right? Because obviously most people, when they go into early access, the uh, the price of the game is lower. So you don't want to harm your yeah. day one sales yeah. just by having an early access period that you didn't need, for, that could have just been a closed beta with people that you trust and care about. Because if you did... It wouldn't recommend like publishing in, in early access uh, to to have that to have that income before it's time to really uh, before it's time to show the game to the public, like to 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 actually let players purchase your game. If that's the reasoning behind you wanting to go into early access and you've exhausted absolutely every uh, avenue that was kind of available to you, then you mm. you know you have to make those decisions. And I've you know I've got friends who've made that kind of decision. It, right. it happens, but it's it needs to be like a last resort because your the decisions going to early access needs to be because you know for the right reasons rather than through pressure financial pressure. Um, and unfortunately, I know that is a state that people kind of find themselves in, but it's not ideal. Yeah. It's probably better to maybe allow players like instead of doing Steam early access, you do it through your website or something like that. Uh, and then you you have the player feedback, but you don't actually publish your access title. I've seen um, quite recently people doing sort of retrospectives on Dwarf Fortress, for example, which is such a huge mm -hmm. outlier in terms of um, how they've been funded over the, you know, was it 10 years, eight years? Um, that period has been extremely long. And then the players kind of coming back and saying, thank you for all the updates over the year. Here's the money that we owed you from eight years ago, essentially. and that community has been really wholesome and supportive, but I've seen a lot of kind of retrospectives and taking what lessons you can learn from that. But I just don't think it's applicable to a lot of people, especially probably people that are watching right now. Um, in terms of going into a sort of website style early access, it's not it's not feasible for a lot of people, especially because the landscape. Not only has it changed from you know between when they first launched into right now, but it's probably shifted you know six, seven, eight times since. Uh, we have a two-parter about demos, uh, whether it is best to remove your demo after you're released and uh, whether it is a good idea to leave the demo up or remove it after a Steam Next Festival. I've also had this conversation really recently. Um, we got a great game coming out soon called Warfrost. Um, we keep putting demos up for it because it's a card game and it go on forever, it's lots of content. Um, it also has a closed beta. And we have extended the demos beyond Steam Next Fest simply because we didn't quite get the visibility that we thought we would within that period. And therefore, the, the feedback wasn't as valuable as it could be. So we extended it. But also, we've you know come to the end of a, not necessarily Steam Next Fest, but another demo period with another um, event and decided to just take it down afterwards because there was far too little interest generated as a result. Um, it really depends on the genre of your game, uh, the kind of feedback that you're getting, and also like the quality of the feedback. It isn't necessarily the amount, because if you've got you know five people really intensely demoing your game and being like, "Yeah, I really like this, but this mechanic isn't working for me. This is what I think about it." Even though it's like armchair game development, it's still you know food for thought for you to consider. Um, you know, I think getting as many demo events that you can, especially Steam Next Fest. Um, mm -hmm. 
and then consider throughout, you know, reassess towards the end of the next fest whether or not you want to keep it up or not. Um, for a launch period, uh, so a discussion I kind of had today with our developers was whether or not a demo to show off the card game that we're playing uh, that we've got. Because it's quite a difficult game. We're quite worried that people will buy it, figure out it's not quite for them, and then refund it, which obviously is detrimental to the developers. It costs you quite a lot of money to get refunds. Um, so we were like, would a demo actually, like, you know, 15 minute time demo, help someone decide whether or not they want to purchase before they purchase? Or would it actually, like, exhaust them and they go, actually, no, this isn't for me? Um, and we lose the sale. But it's whether or not you kind of want a quality sale. And it's not to say that people that buy your game wouldn't refund it anyway, but you know, people are kind of lazy and they might forget to refund it, or and then that sale has been made anyway. So we we were trying to juggle all juggle all these thoughts and figure out what makes sense for this community. So it is really like genre dependent, community dependent. Mm -hmm. uh, a question that just came in about Steam Next Fest: When should you sign up for the Steam Next Fest? Um, as soon as you can, because then you can start working on your demo if you want to. Right. That makes sense. Obviously, keep an eye on um, Steam's embargo, because you don't want to announce to your community that you've got a demo coming out before Steam has said yes. <laughs> mm. All right, a few more questions. EL is asking, uh, when you're early in development and you just want to know if your game will generate interest, how do you find your public? Not exactly to market it, Maybe some early community building. Um, again, I think it's kind of genre dependent because there's a really cool point and click community called Lazy Laces that I tend to tap into uh, occasionally. And then you've got, um, you know, like our Nintendo Switch, for example. You can see who's posting up there about what kind of games they're interested in. You can always, you know, have, don't worry about sending people like cold messages and just say, hey, I've seen that you're into this. Would you be interested in this? Um, also, people on Twitter mm. never, um, never too early to like DM people and ask them if they're interested. Typically, even now, like at Chocofish, who are a fairly sizable um, and pretty respected indie, I would say, um, a lot of our closed betas specifically have other devs in them because community aren't necessarily all that interested in giving like constant feedback they'll do it at their own pace whereas other devs are really interested in kind of the creative aspect of it um so also having like a development community is really important i feel especially if you're a solo dev it can feel like you're sort of ripping your hair out stuck on something and you know it's always good to trade notes with the person that sat next to you or well, virtually sat next to you at least right so i mean it should probably happen organically and if you're working on a game that you're really interested in, then you're probably a part of a community where those games are being discussed and you can start there anyway. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Friend, friends are always helpful as well, but just be mm -hmm. aware that they're either going to be like, this game sucks and here's all the brutal feedback that you, that you probably don't want to hear right now. Or they're going to be like, yeah, this is the best thing ever. And it's not like helpful is feedback. Really, is it really a good idea to, uh, invest in community management and community building before you see that it's happening organically. Mm. You, it's a bit of a tricky one because even if community is happening organically, you still need to keep an eye on it. So investing in that space, regardless of if it's not built, not growing or if it is growing, is kind of important anyway, because uh, like I mentioned, obviously, it's really easy for those spaces to get super toxic very quickly. And someone might just pop into your, you know, you might have five people in your Discord. Someone might pop in there, see that there's two guys, I don't know, being racist or sexist or whatever. And they'll just be like, nope. And you won't know that that person's disappeared. Um, so it's still always worth, regardless, to maintain those gardens, you know? <laughs> it's a good tape. Uh, a few more questions. Randy Dev is asking, uh, their game is releasing at March 16th, and they just finished polishing the build, and they're happy with it, and send it for Steam review. Uh, their specified release date to be March 16th, but uh, they don't know whether they will be able 
to our yeah, but that question is a bit a bit weird actually. I think they're asking whether uh, they can they can polish polish the game before it's published. Before um, March sixteenth. Yeah, a bit a bit hard. Okay, uh, Lauren is asking. We are currently working on a narrative game around ten to twelve hours, and uh, their team is thinking about making it a two part game. So create a bundle. What is your opinion on this? So, uh, so is then it would be split bundle. into two six-hour pieces? Yeah, I guess so. I think Maybe. as long as it makes sense narratively, right? Because you want to end on a point where it's like, oh, I need to know more. I need to know what's happening next. Um, I mean, episode games, they were fashionable once. Then they were not so fashionable. And I think like now they ended up in some sort of equilibrium and there are some titles that are really successful episodically and then maybe it doesn't make sense for a lot of other games so you should really you should really ask yourself that question whether it makes sense for your game and its narrative to break it up i suspect the only reason why you would break it up because that would be just, well, just thinking really... logistically, that's two admin pages that you have to maintain. So if you do like Steam News, for example, you have to update both pages. Um, or if you've got like capsule changes, you have to update both pages, that kind of thing. So there's also like an admin aspect of it. It's whether or not you want to do upkeep on that. Yeah. And then if the first part is not attracting attention, then the second part will probably attract even less attention. Just a really hard question. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Like you're obviously your part two is going to sell less as a result so it's whether or not you feel it makes sense narratively to allow people to kind of work away from that first part um it's also like i say with the admin your sales that sort of thing uh, sort of thing all right um any tips on finding an interesting perspective to tell about the game and interest potential players when you're making a trailer trailer or writing a steam description so like, what's your hook for the game? And I know it really depends on the genre, but maybe a few general tips. It's, um, this isn't necessarily a marketing question. This is actually, uh, like a game design question, right? You, you want to look at the reasons that your player needs to continue, what, what features would sit within your game that are unique to it. What's, um, so you've got like, uh, in operations management, it's called like a order winner and, uh, I think like an order neutral and an order winner and an order neutral is essentially like, okay, it's a Metroidvania. It has uh, doors that essentially lead you back in a loop and that's fun kind of thing. Um, so that's like interesting, but that, it's not necessarily a key feature, but it's, it, you know, it's got some interesting game design uh, elements to it, but your order winner there would be not only do they do this cool thing with the map, but actually the map tilts or like the map uh, inverts on itself, Castlevania style. And like not many devs are doing that this, uh, these days. So like, what are these key features within the the gameplay that actually would probably be interesting to you as a gamer, but also interesting to your players? Because, you know, heavens knows, I work on a lot of games that I wouldn't be interested in as a player. Um, <laughs> but that can also be helpful as well, because you're like, okay, what would interest me in, uh, what would make this interesting to me as someone who has no interest in this genre? Right. Um, and that can work, especially... Uh, it's interesting that you say trailer and store page as well because I will look at the store page when I'm going through like a trailer brief for um, we have a great guy called Matt Farding who's the best trailer guy in my opinion uh, and basically uh, when I'm writing a brief I'll look through our Steam page and I'll look at all the key uh, key features that we want to put forward and say like the, it needs to hit these beats and these are the screenshots uh, sorry these are the video shots that we need in order to demonstrate that mm -hmm. Right, uh, it's getting a bit late here, and uh, I think I should be letting go. One last question: uh, Imagine that you're a successful developer, or maybe you know, like not super successful, but someone who released their game and it's semi-successful. People are buying it. Now you're planning on updating it with some new content. When is the point when you should be starting to market? that new major content update? Um, 
also depends if you're in early access, I guess, because you could start beta testing it within the community before you push out that update, um, which I would advise doing maybe like a month, two weeks, three weeks before. So you can iron out all those bugs before it goes out to the wider community. Um, otherwise, if it's not in early access, I would say um, you can start talking about it, hinting it, saying it's coming. Um, probably... I think, again, it's genre dependent, but usually I would say like a month. Like today we dropped a content update. Um, we kind of beyonce it and just stuck it out there uh, just because the community, it's an, for Starmancer, it's an early access game. So, um, you know, they were already aware that this piece of content was out there and they could opt in using a, a specific dev branch if they wanted to. But today is the sort of public announcement of it. So, um, and we didn't do any kind of build up to that. We just let it go out organically to see what would happen. So it could also be zero days, but I like a good month lead up. Um, and even then, um, that's when you would start. You would start planning your campaign work to promote that again another two months ahead of that even. So like three months before you think, okay, this update's coming. What's kind of important about it? How do we get it out there the best we can? Let's start doing capture. Let's start thinking about what an update trailer looks like. What kind of screenshots we need to be hitting? Um Blogs and if you've you know if you're on Steam you need to send them off for uh, you know if you've got your game in different languages you need to send them off for localization that kind of thing so you just want to get it all down out your head onto a page and figure out what you want to prioritize. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I actually one one more question that's just <laughs> entered uh, my life: Steam keys and how you approach Steam keys, whether you're sending Steam keys prior to release uh, for reviews, whether you're uh, letting people request Steam keys, and what is your general advice to developers regarding the recent news that Steam is changing their policy uh, for requesting Steam keys? Um, so I don't use Steam's curation system because I think it's garbage, um, and they know it's not very good either. Um, typically, you'll have people like, hot gamer daddy with 10,000 followers on their curation mm -hmm. page, they'll be like, I want five to 10 keys off you. Just ignore them. Just absolutely ignore them. Do not work with Steam curators. They're awful. They're scammy. They, you, you'll you see your keys end up on um, key reselling sites. Don't bother Thank with them. For out in my Steam curator account. <laughs> um, right, so... You I should don't... not give Steam keys to random people, but what is like your strategy for using Steam keys? Um, so I'll tend to take about 200 for press initially, and obviously mm. time dependent. So if I've got like a, I don't know, a preview session first before reviews, then I'll only need maybe like 30, if that. Um, for me, I mean, you've seen my how I get all my influencer data i don't use there's, there's things like key mailer which um i've used in the past but it's really hard to it can be really hard to figure out who is legit on there as well it will make your life a little bit easier because you can basically set up your game in the in their system and then you can just get start getting key requests and you can approve or deny them and they've got like a verification system on there however i've had i have a really good relationship with um an influencer who's actually been a long time friend of mine like we went to school together level um and they requested a key through key mailer for a game that i know they already have a key for so i messaged them being like hey um is this is this you what's going on and they're like i don't have a key mailer account i don't know why that's verified i don't know why that's um i don't know why you've got like a request for that that's like a fake account even though key mailer had given them a tick so it's weird um and i brought it up with key mailer and they were kind of like this is quite rare really sorry about it um but you know so i don't know really but now i do everything manually i go on to um if i give you these slides you can you know you can tweet about it or give them yeah, out right because uh, all my notes are on there but i i use solino i look at you know mm. uh monster train slay the spire who's been playing that Go on, it literally takes me ages, but go onto their Twitch page, find them, because they are your audience. They're not just someone random that might sell your key. I think the lesson here is that doing it manually, like really putting your hands to work, is always better than just sending 3,000 keys in hopes that maybe some will, some of them will review a game on YouTube, and maybe it will be big. 
And the thing is, you know, I've worked with PR companies. I've worked with PR companies and they've given me like their distribution lists for their influencers. Mm. Um, not with their emails and things, but like just their usernames. And then I've gone to check through these usernames. And I'm like, why the hell are you giving a key for this? Like, why the hell are you giving a key for Stardew Valley to someone who is like a CSGO pro? Like, obviously, they're not going to play it and show their audience. That key's just going to sit there not even be redeemed like it the email that you've got for them probably goes to their manager and they'll probably reply back saying yes if you want him to play it it's 50k like so pr companies don't always get it right the only way you can 100 percent be sure that that is going to go to a proper audience is if you do it yourself yeah like fellas do um well i think we should wrap it up um thank you everyone for joining joined us today and thank you alexis uh Please tell us where, where can people find you if they want to follow your work? Oh, uh, I barely tweet, but I'm... Yeah, and obviously for Chucklefish, it's at Chucklefish LTD uh, on Twitter. Right. I don't really have any if other channels. Follow, if you want to follow IndyCap, we're at GTP IndyCap uh, until Elon breaks Twitter and there's no more Twitter. Maybe Mastodon? I don't know. I'll see you. On TikTok, <laughs> I guess. All right. Thank you, Alexis. Thank you, everyone. It was really good chatting with you. I hope we can do it one once more in the future. And yeah, this session will be recorded and published on our YouTube. And then we'll maybe do some recap on our website as well in text format. Thank you. Right. Yeah, thank you. Have a very nice evening, and we can't wait for Chucklefish's new games. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>